Okay, we are in our final session, uh, excitingly. So thanks to everyone for sticking with us. Um, the final conversation we're gonna have is on a new ma macro financial settlement. So what does a fi macro financial regime for a just transition look like, both domestically and internationally? What should a new macroeconomic regime in a high income country context look like? What is the appropriate role for private and public actors in financing a green transition. We're going to be covering all of this. Also unpacking the promises and pitfalls of the de-risking state in which sectors is de-risking avoidable to accelerate, uh, unavoidable sorry, <laughs> to accelerate a green transition <laughs> and in which areas may uh, de-risking present more problems than solutions. I know we might have differing opinions on the panel in the wider room, so it, it kind of promises to be a rich discussion. Um, on our panel, we have Dr. Deva Kadat, is a lecturer in development economics at King's College London. Her research is focused on the political economy of foreign exchange intervention, central bank swap agreements, the political economy of development policy, and macroeconomic policy in developing economics. And she's the co-author of Decolonizing Economics, which is soon to be out. Uh, we have Katie Kedwood, who is an economist at uh, here, the UCL IIPP, and a consultant at the World Bank working on the nature transition. Katie started her career in capital markets at the Royal Bank of Canada as a government bond and derivative specialist. Prior to joining UCL, she worked in green banking at Share Action, uh, the Responsible Investment NGO, and as a researcher for George Monbiot, focusing on sustainable food systems. And joining us online is Dr. Brett Christophers, a professor of geography at Uppsala University. He's interested in various aspects of Western capitalism, both today and historically. He's particular interests in urban and housing issues, as well as the energy transition and financialization. His recent publications include two books, By Verso, The New Enclosure, The Appropriation of Public Land in Neoliberal Britain, and rentier capitalism, who owns the economy and who pays for it. And someone was asking if you're going to be sharing all the, all the new books you're going to be writing, Brett, uh, in this, <laughs> in this uh, session. But I'll hand over to Katie, who's going to kick us off with some opening remarks. Great. Um, so obviously a new macro financial settlement is a really broad topic. I'm going to zoom in and focus on one aspect of it, uh, which is uh, central banks. They're not the only actors by any means to be uh, relevant for this topic, but that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm also going to take a, a global north focus for my discussion, but I think what I'm saying has implications for the global south, which we can talk about in, in the discussion. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the campaigning movement for, for greening finance um, has focused a lot on central banks as a, as a leverage point for changing the financial system, and I myself have worked on this topic both as an academic researcher and as a campaigner for, for over six years now. And that movement has been very effective in, in lots of ways. So central banks now seriously consider uh, the risks posed by climate change to be a core part of their mandates, for example, and they've dedicated time and, and resources to building institutional capacity on, the, on these topics. However, um, as I think a lot of people in this room would agree, we've got to a point now where the ideal of what is a, a green central bank has become really quite contested. Um, so on the one hand, uh, in academic research and advocacy, um, uh, people in these groups tend to see the role of a central bank as ensuring the financial system is supporting and not undermining the structural economic transition that we need. Um, and yeah, we now have like really well articulated policy proposals to this end. So for example, differentiated interest rates to green and collateral frameworks, um, using the prudential regime to, to mitigate carbon risk in portfolios. There's lots of great stuff out there. On the other hand, um, when you go into a typical central bank in the global north, as I have done many times now, you quickly realize that central bankers themselves see their role in green finance as relevant only insofar as they're required to ensure that climate change and climate policies don't pose risks to individual financial balance sheets. Uh, sometimes they, they, they talk about the systemic angle, but really it's kind of that individual micro focus, which is what they, what they want to talk about, what they're comfortable talking about. So, um, so yeah, my comments today are, are, are based on a paper which I've written with Daniela Gabor and, and, and Josh Ryan Collins. And in our paper, we kind of... Um, position these different conceptualizations of what a green central bank is along a spectrum. 
which slides from, on the one hand, uh, a very narrow market-fixing supervisory agenda, which is about enhancing price discovery through disclosures, uh, stress testing, in order to minimise these kind of financial stability risks. Along the spectrum, you then move to what I term, or what we've termed, monetary de-risking, that is the use of monetary policy tools to um, nudge price signals in, uh, for, for green versus dirty assets. Um, so this would, um, some of the experiments that the ECB have done, for example, uh, uh, fall into this category. And then right at the other end, um, we have what we could call this kind of explicit credit allocation mode, which is perhaps more of an ideal, where central bank toolkits are actually subordinated to kind of broader government strategies for decarbonisation. And I would argue we don't see that anywhere, really, save perhaps China, and even in the Chinese case, you know, you could kind of query uh, what, they're, what they're doing there, whether it's really um, explicit credit policy. Um, so there's been a lot of work done on why market fixing and, and de-risking actions in green finance might be insufficient alone to green, to green the financial system. I'm not going to repeat that here. But what I want to emphasise is I don't think it's going to be possible for central banks to move along this spectrum to this more active climate, pa climate policymaker role without reckoning with the underlying macro financial architecture that really kind of constrains and, and shapes their, their policy choices. And I think central banks um, are really facing three sets of constraints. Um, on the one hand, we have this institutional commitment to uh, monetary dominance, so inflation targeting, which explicitly rejects any form of, of credit policy. Secondly, we have the market-based credit creation system where um, bonds, particularly sovereign bonds, really sit, sit at the heart of how financing uh, takes place. And thirdly, we have um, a broad <coughs> set of pressures within the international epistemic community to really kind of narrow cr climate issues to this very na narrow financial stability uh, legitimation. And I think these constraints really become apparent when we look at recent attempts to green monetary policy. Um, and I'm going to focus on the, the ECB case. Uh, and in our paper, we talk about um, greening monetary policy as a kind of carrots versus sticks um, approach. This is how the, the NGFS, the group of central banks who have written extensively on green issues, is how they frame it themselves. So the carrots option seem, seeks to use monetary policy operations <coughs> to, as tools basically to mobilise private finance into green assets by improving their investability. So this is classic de-risking. You kind of change the risk reward profile. So that's like cheaper refinancing options, preferential collateral treatment. The other option is where I think it becomes really interesting, carrots plus sticks. So using monetary policy operations also to penalise the allocation of credit towards uh, dirty purposes or uh, purposes that aren't seen as, as transaction compatible. And this is where we argue central banks are veering, when they attempt to do this, veer dangerously close to a form of credit policy which really sits uneasily within their current uh, kind of inflation targeting uh, domain. And that's been made very apparent with the ECB's experiment with tilting its asset purchase portfolio, which it attempted to do in 2022, um, which saw it departing from its usual territory by requiring it to essentially take a discretionary view on the climate performance of corporations, so moving beyond just monitoring bank balance sheets. And notably, it required really uncomfortable new institutional mechanisms to actually monitor and, and discipline these corporate actors beyond, beyond the banking system. And what this revealed is there's actually a really fine line to tread between sectoral allocation criteria, which is justified on the basis of financial risk and stability purposes, as the ECB attempted to do, and just outright sectoral targeting that's typical of credit policy. What kind of institutional mechanisms can actually tread this fine line effectively within the current uh, inflation targeting regime? And as we saw, the ECB faced pushback both from within other Eurosystem central banks, the international central banking community on these policy choices. It had all these ac accusations of mission creep from the Fed, other major central banks, accusations of it being distracted from its um, uh, main mandate as, as inflation was picking up. And under these pressures, they actually only ended up following the tilting programme for about nine months. Um, they fully abandoned it in June last year. And just to put that in context, this is after it had spent two to three years investing substantially in a climate strategy review, a climate roadmap, um, a fully fledged strategy on a pathway to greening monetary policy. After two to three years of this, the ECB position, the ECB's position today actually looks very, uh, doesn't look that different to the Fed in terms of actually acting on climate only in terms of this very narrow micro prudential risk focus. So um, just to conclude, I think, what this experience reveals is the limits of the current 
macro financial regime in affecting in enabling the effective decarbonisation in finance that we need to see to support industrial policy and, and broader goals. Market neutrality is a principle that's at the heart of the inflation targeting central bank and but using monetary policy tools to penalise credit allocation necessarily challenges it and undermines it even if you attempt to do that with a with a risk-based logic and um, yeah these pressures to conform to monetary dominance as we've seen in the ECB end up constraining their their actions to the a quite a narrow set of policy tools which leaves us with this um, private finance lead decarbonisation state take a back seat and just kind of enable it and it provide the enabling conditions. Um, so, yeah, I think to a lot of people in this room, this might seem like a, a, an obvious conclusion, maybe. But I, I, I think it's important to emphasise, particularly now, if we look at the political situation in the UK, we have a potential Labour government coming into power. They don't want to challenge the Bank of England at all. They've committed to, to maintaining the status quo. And I think that the kinds of policy tools we, we're going to see, are not gonna, we're not going to be able to make that shift it's unlikely to materialise unless we reckon with monetary dominance, unless we reckon with operational independence and the market-based finance that kind of form the foundations of how the state fundamentally interacts with, with the private financial system. And I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Katie, for those insightful opening remarks. Um, I will move to Brett now, online. <clears throat> Thanks, Anna. Um, hi, everybody. It's nice to be uh, to be with you virtually. Um, so I'm going to I'll, I'll do my best to stick to the instructions in terms of um, what 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 uh, I was wanted to talk about, and also to try to keep it to three or three to five minutes or so. Um, I'm going to talk. So what I'm going to say is is going to be focused specifically on energy. Um, I think that's important to say. So obviously, the idea of a, of a transition, uh, not least of a just transition, doesn't apply only to energy, of course, but energy is a big part of it. Um, so what I'm going to say is it will be focused specifically on energy. And I think what I want to say, um, I'm just going to say a few, a few things, and I think they um, are more um, kind of premises than arguments, so to speak. I think they are points that I think are worth putting out there um, as propositions for kind of where things are at um, and hopefully they can be uh, points that people can, um, we can take as, as sort of starting points for discussion. I think they're, they're all probably contestable to one extent or another but they are, as I say, more of the nature of premises than arguments. So the, fir the first of those, and these are, and these are all based upon um, the research that I've, that I've done into these into these questions. So the first of those is that is, is, a, is a very simple point, um, but I think it's an important point, which is simply to say that um, uh, the, 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 a transition, um, and not least a just transition, is something that is that is very very expensive. Um, it's it's not something that can or will be achieved cheaply, um, and and of course that means that we. Um, uh, all of us collectively have to pay for that transition, um, either, uh, you know, as, as consumers, as taxpayers, um, in, in one capacity or, or another. And I think that um, one thing that's, that's become quite clear to me is that um, politicians, policymakers, are, who have got themselves into a little bit of a sticky position by um, sometimes claiming, sometimes pretending, sometimes wanting to believe that all of this, you know, potentially can be done relatively cheaply, whereas, whereas I, I think it's fairly clear that's absolutely not the case. I think they, they also sometimes get themselves into a sticky position by um, thinking of the costs in a very kind of narrow sense, which is to say um, focusing specifically on, 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 on costs within the energy sector and as energy consumers without making it clear that you know, we should be thinking about this in a much in a much more holistic sense, which is to say that yes, it might be it might, it might be costly um, uh, to transition the energy sector, but the benefits in terms of wider costs, ecological costs, social costs, costs relating to health costs, and so on, uh, obviously vastly outweigh savings. There vastly outweigh any cost that we incur within the energy sector uh, specifically. So the first. It first is a basic point about the cost of this. The second thing to say is that in terms of states versus the private sector, 
Um, again, it's a very obvious point, which is simply that states clearly have a vastly varying capacity to finance all of this in, in different parts of the world. And, I, and, and one thing that seems fairly clear to me is that, that we have, we're in a very problematic position, which is that the states that in a way have the, the, the least capacity to finance this are often those states in parts of the world where the need for investment is often greatest. Um, so the, the degree of challenge um, and the degree of need are often um, diametri diametrically opposed to, to one another. Um, and I think we need to we need to be thinking very clearly about that. And I think the other thing to say is that is that you know we, we also increasingly seem to be in a situation that even even where states are in a relatively strong position to finance uh, the transition um, uh, in one way or another, they have they are in a position where they believe, or at least they've been persuaded to believe that they are not in a strong position to do that. Um, and so we exist in a situation where um, the real and or perceived ability of states to finance a lot of this uh, appears to be relatively constrained at this particular moment in time at any rate. So the third thing, for, and following from, on from that, is I think that you know, the question of what, what the, appropriate, the appropriate roles of state uh, versus private sector in financing a just transition might be um, is one thing. Um, but so, uh, uh, but obviously, the um, that's uh, I think when we're thinking about uh, the question of appropriateness, we can think about that in a theoretical sense, uh, but also in a realistic sense. So, whatever the appropriate role is, the reality is that private finance is and will continue to be absolutely key to this because of those constraints, whether they are externally imposed or self-imposed, on the state's capacity to finance this. So. Private finance is key, it will continue to be key whether we like that or not. And I think that um, we need to recognise that private finance is and will continue to play a key role in all of this. And then the, the final point, again, following on from that, the final premise I would make is that precisely because states are determined for very, very good reasons to keep the cost of the transition, at least the cost to consumers, down, I think the reality is that the profits that are available to the private sector, both in terms of the energy sector per se, but also in terms of uh, energy finance, are actually are actually quite low because of the inability to charge um, what energy companies and energy financiers might want to want to charge in areas such as renewables. And I think because of the relatively constrained nature of profitability, it seems to me unavoidable that. Um, uh, for want of a better word, uh, de-risking of, of private sector investment uh, is continue is going to continue to be at the heart of all of this. Even if that, uh, even if if the, the state kind of subsidisation of private sector finance, private sector profitability sticks in the craw, um, seems to me that it's better than the better than the alternative, which is not de-risking and the investment not occurring in the first place. So those are the, the premises that I would want to uh, put out on the table, uh, and hopefully they can you, be used as a starting point for discussion. So thank you. Thanks, Brett. <laughs> we'll move to Devika. Um, thanks, everyone, for being here, and thanks for the invitation. As I said to some people yesterday, I'm very excited by this specific gathering, because unfortunately, I've been in many where I'm the only economist saying, what about the global south? Uh, and I'm glad that finally I don't have to play that role. Uh, so yeah, to focus on, to think about uh, the key prompts for, for uh, this panel, I really have not much, nothing much new to say, because I think so much has been said uh, yesterday and today, so I guess in a way I'm mostly summarizing some of this stuff. Uh, because, but I guess we need to realize that all questions that we're talking about right now are really questions of development policy that have been an, on the agenda of uh, governments in the global south since political decolonization back in the mid, mid 20th century. And in a way, it's good that now we're all in it together, but not quite because the, the challenges remain the same. Uh, so therefore, like if you need to go back to the same institutions, we need to go back to the development agenda, which unfortunately is a non-starter. So anyway, I have four main things to say that 
that some of the key questions in this panel, I think, were already answered today, yesterday and today, uh, and the panel on industrial policy. Um, and there's substantial view agreement, in my view, about the fact that private finance is not available, as Ilyas pointed out yesterday, in the scale and speed required. I, I, I think Brett's point is correct that private finance will have to pay, play a key role given uh, the macroeconomic situation we're in. However, it's not sufficient given for the scale and speed required. It's only going largely to rich countries in, uh, in projects of climate mitigation and not adaptation. And that's also because they're not going to adaptation in the global south primarily at all. Um, and, and, and unsurprisingly, it's because it's guided by uh, the profit motive and, much, and perhaps only these activities within the transition are profitable and that's why they're going there. And other activities that are more crucial are simply not profitable. So we, sh we shouldn't really be surprised that this is the case. Uh, it's because it's relatively not as, because these activities have already be been de-risked by the uh, state in the global north. And insofar as it has been de-risked in the states of the global south, that's where it's going. So the challenge really is, how do we mobilize finance for other, for other activities? And we all know the answer. We've already had that discussion today. It's the state. And therefore, unfortunately, this is not a new discussion. And that's why, like yesterday, I was a bit surprised because some we were, we were somehow there was like, there is fiscal capacity in the global south. I genuinely don't see it. And the challenge has been for 50 years and continues to be that we need to actively, constantly, uh, indefa indefatigably worry about fiscal space in the global south and constantly do everything internationally and nationally to make it happen. Given that we are positioned here and that in the United States and the UK, not so much in the UK, but in general, this is where the power to influence international institutions which govern global economic governance lies. The challenge remains, continues to be that we have to ensure that there is fiscal capacity. Also in terms of domestic revenue mobilization, of taxation, uh, as far as 2020, uh, even, even as recently as 2020, uh, institutions like the IMF, which were the key lenders of uh, emergency finance, were saying taxation is chill, it's all cool, but there was not a single mention of like capital gains taxation, wealth taxation, income taxation. It was like value added taxation everywhere. Now, I'm not opposed to value added taxation, by all means, tax value added if you want to, but it's not necessarily progressive and really the key, the key revenue resources will, will come from. Uh, so again, this again, nothing new I'm saying, but as I said, I think we cannot underestimate the fact at how undermined fiscal capacity is in the global south, and I will keep saying it as long as it is the case, especially post-pandemic. Um, the second thing I want to mention is about um, and this is also a challenge in the global north because clearly like austerity is is well is is as uh, i think brett said is going to be on the agenda in the united kingdom and in and europe in the foreseeable future and it's bad for everyone even here um the second thing i want to say is that as many i like how Mel melanie framed it that this is really a global coordination problem to think about the energy transition it's a global investment problem uh and 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 that uh if this were an investment problem primarily guided by private finance and private interests, it is prone and has been prone to uh, capital strike and that's something we cannot leave, something so crucial, such, such a crucial political agenda at the whims and fancies of people like Elon Musk and the like. Um, and so, but, and, and I agree, it absolutely is a global coordination problem and this might not seem like a macroeconomic settlement discussion but I think it very firmly is because unfortunately when we think of macroeconomics we often think nationally and we don't realize that the coordination and the macroeconomic discussion is, has to be international and global so given 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 that uh, the the key movement in power production and finance within this global coordination problem is in rich countries is in Europe and the United States prim primarily uh, and the impacts of this have been and continue to be global in fact there has never been a time in modern history when macroeconomic stability in the global north has not been premised on either weight suppression or instability in the global south, not a single instance of it. And hence we need to make sure that uh, whatever coordination happens has to happen given that into account, taking, that in, taking that into account. I know this is like pie in the sky, I'm not giving you practical things to work with, but still it's, it's, the point is that we need to recognize, because until we recognize that these are the key problems, it, uh, practicality is pointless in my view, but that's again, I'm an academic, I get to say this stuff. Um, in a way, it's quite cliche <laughs> to point out that this was 
this did take place during the uh, the interwar and the Second World War. Uh, in fact, I was just reading recently uh, Jamie Martin's book called The Meddlers, who, where he lays out uh, the fact that they, the coordination of key um, key materials resources was coordinated between Allied powers for several. I mean, a few, a couple, of, at least a couple of decades uh, to mobilize for the war effort. So it's, and, and that always created a tension between domestic sovereignty and uh, coordination. And of course, that's a fine balance, but that's something that has already historically happened. So we have to make that happen in a way which, is, uh, which, is, which takes into account the current geopolitical reality. Which brings me to my third point, is that there's been a lot of discussion about global coordination, and that's extremely important. But we have to, again, recognize that we are living in an imperial system. And we have to figure out how to get around the present imperial power configuration. Uh, for instance, in, in the 1970s, uh, so not 1970s, the 1990s, after the Asian financial crisis, um, Asian countries tried to get together to figure out their own arrangement where they won't need to rely on the IMF to create the Chiang Mai initiative. Uh, and they wanted to disperse finance on their own terms in different ways until it was linked to the IMF conditions. That you cannot get finance from the Chiang Mai initiative unless you fulfill IMF conditionalities anyway. Uh, and this was because of, again, imperial meddling from the United States, from Japan, into the Chiang Mai Initiative. And as a result, the Chiang Mai Initiative has, has been used a grand zero, a total of zero times, zero, uh, since its inception. And so we have to take into account that these realities exist. And therefore, there will be imperial meddling in whatever configuration and whatever coordination we try to come up with. Therefore, as Fadel pointed out yesterday, that, that we have to mobilize around, I don't know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, we have to become like China supremacists or something. But the point is there are key nodes and we have to identify those key nodes where the strategic, strategic alliances can take place and build upon that. Um, um, yeah, and again, f f naming front and center. I mean, Amir kind of hinted, I don't know where Amir went. Yeah, there he is, <laughs> kind of hinted towards the, the, you know, the evil powers uh, involved. I mean, I'm, I'm one of them, he, he mentioned something else. I'm saying it's the United States imperial power, the United States Treasury and the Federal Reserve. We have to figure out how to deal with that stuff. And finally, I guess this is more towards uh, to people like me. I think some of the concepts that we're talking about today, which are absolutely what Katie mentioned, what uh, Brett mentioned about credit allocation, market-based finance, monetary dominance. These are all things that we teach as economists and teach our students who then become like, uh, who go to these policy spaces and then inform all this discussion. And as we all know in this room that this is based on faulty economic theory, it's not true, it's not correct, and that we cannot stop fundamentally changing, fighting against the behemoth of economics that it has, that this edifice that we have of capitalism that st stop standing in the way of a green transition is perfectly in line with the education system and the, its indoctrination that students face in terms of economics education. And we cannot stop reforming that. We cannot stop changing that. And mostly that, again, a lot of the people in the room are already doing the various things that I've mentioned. So in a way, it's like, I guess, despite uh, the chief pessimist in the room, the chief party pooper, is that I guess we keep doing some of that and I have these strategic alliances amongst ourselves. Anyway, this is mostly, that's it for me. I'm gonna stop. Thank you so much. Um, before I kind of move us into group discussion, I thought I'd let the panel respond to each other a bit and maybe throw in a question, um, which is around like, institutional arrangements, which we didn't talk about uh, in the first panel on industrial policy, um, but I thought we could bring it into, yeah, what kind of institutional arrangements are needed for, for macro, a new macro financial settlement? Uh, maybe focusing in on, on credit policy, which is something you brought up, Katie. Yeah, yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so if we imagined this ideal of a climate policy-making central bank, which doesn't exist anywhere in the world at the moment, I think it would look very different institutionally. Um, firstly, inflation targeting would not be the purview of the central bank. It would be a broader set of policy tools which tackle inflation. Um, therefore, it's kind of Essentially, we're talking about fiscal dominance, right, um, in this pie in the sky thinking. Um, I think necessarily that would require new inst institutional configurations. Um, 
greater coordination with other public actors such as state-owned investment banks, most notably. Um, the, the, in post-war France, actually, they had a really good system of, of credit guidance. Very different because it was um, much more of a kind of closed financial system than today. But they had lots of different institutional configurations such as a National Credit Council, which operated together with the central bank to kind of allocate credit whilst the central bank focused more on monetary policy. So institutionally, the way credit policy has been historically um, implemented across the world is, is very different, um, but I think there's, there's things we can draw from that. Applying it to, to, to the 21st century financial system, however, is a different question, and I think you actually need, um, all of this would, would require interventions to constrain market-based finance, because without that, you have this kind of back door for, for credit creation to continue. And actually, we, we see this at the moment in, in how um, capital is continually being allocated to um, fossil assets fossil assets which banks are divesting from because of ESG disclosure requirements who's picking up the tab private equity mm -hmm. and, f and and pension funds are still able to to, to, to allocate um, credit via via pri private equity um, and then you kind of have the repo market um, angle as well so there needs to be a whole set of like financial regulation that attempts somehow I'm not sure how I don't have the answers to constrain market-based finance um, that that's a that's a given and then finally I think um, developing institutional capacity within the public sector to enable this state coordination. Um, especially in this country, we've had 40 years of outsourcing of public skills to the consultancy sector. So your average civil servant, you know, you ask them to, to, to deliver a credit policy, there's a lot of skills building that needs to, to go on there. Um, and that, I think that applies to broader industrial policy as well, actually, not just credit policy. So yeah, that's what I'd start with. Thank you, yeah, really insightful. Um, Brett or Devika, do you want to pick up on anything on the institutional arrangements question, or uh, yeah, that big. Brett's not nodding. So okay. I'll come to you, Devika. <laughs> um, yeah, because he's behind me, so I can't see. Um, yeah, I mean, about I think you're completely right about the question of, and and I I didn't want to say in my remarks because they're already too long and ranty um, that. Uh, credit allocation actually was part of several central banks, uh, not climate credit allocation, mm -hmm. uh, but credit allocation policies have been used in several countries in the global south in the past for developmental roles, but then because of the neoliberal state have been subsequently quashed. So once again, like uh, sort of uh, bringing back development discussions into the agenda are beneficial for, you know, also governments uh, or central banks in the uh, global north as well. So this is what I meant about sort of making sure we bring back all of those discussions that we've been having for decades about how to do this, which were in which, in which uh, we can learn from experiences in the global global south. Uh, for instance, I know the Reserve Bank of India used to have a credit allocation policy for uh, agricultural policy, and now it really it's, it's not it doesn't really use it anymore, even though it does have the um, uh, mandate to do so. But about state capacity, I think you're absolutely correct that that, that state capacity needs to be built. And this is again, I, I'm, I'm a broken record where fiscal ca fiscal capacity is the problem because the first thing you want to cut every time there is a fiscal crisis is that we have to freeze the wages, we have to cut the public sector, and how can we build fisc public sector capacity in this environment when we're constantly being forced to cut uh, key civil servants for key service delivery. In fact, I genuinely think that this is something that underappreciated when we talk about institutional arrangements and institutions in the global south that the governments are very corrupt in the global south the institutions are very corrupt in the global south and i think it doesn't help to deny that they are part of it but like that's nothing new that's not special for the global south but also the states in the global south are really really small compared to the number of people they serve they're really, really small, and genuinely, I sound like I sound really stupid when I say this. Have we tried throwing money at the problem? No, we haven't. Have we tried consistently throwing money at the problem? No, we really haven't. For instance, again, I'm from India, so this is the case I know the most because there's rent-seeking, corruption, and bribery at every step of the way because there's there's simply not enough public services to go around. The public say hospitals that exist, they're like few beds for hundreds of thousands of people and therefore the people who are the richest can get to the front of the line by bribing somebody in the in the service delivery and I'm not saying this would be eliminated if there were more public hospital beds but have we tried I don't think we have I'm, seriously um, and so in that part of capacity building I think we can never we can never get out of the fact that we will need to go through the painful process of hopefully throwing money at the problem 
because we genuinely haven't done that in the global south at least i don't know what you guys if that's something that's yeah also in the global north but at least not recently so that's really <laughs> thank you say. that's really helpful brett do you want to respond to any of those comments or on and on the institutional arrangements before we no, I just, I mean, I, the first the first thing you asked Anna about whether um, any of us had any questions for each other, um, I just I wanted to ask Katie actually something that she alluded to in, when she was talking about central banks and she mentioned China. Um, if she could expand a little bit about um, on, what, on what China and I think the Japanese central banks are doing differently in terms of climate policy, if you want to call it, I don't know whether policy is the right word, from Western central banks. Um, I don't know if this is if this is a specific topic that's been raised in the last couple of days, but I would, I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about that and some of the thoughts that Katie and, and I'm, I'm assuming that uh, you addressed this in your paper with Daniela and, uh, and with Josh, if you could say a bit more about what's going on there. Yeah, China's an interesting case. Um, I kind of caveated it in my in my comments there, um, because I think what they're doing is credit policy. Mm. I just wouldn't say it's green credit policy. Um, so the, yeah, the Chinese, I mean, it, the state is just so enmeshed within the, the credit creation system in China that the state can literally just tell a bank to lend to a certain company and it will do that. And that's essentially how it works, broadly speaking. Um, they have kind of made moves to formalize it a bit more over recent years and kind of justify things a bit more in terms of the, the green finance language that we see in the international sphere. Um, the PBOC um, previously has actually been very active within the NGFS, which is very interesting. Um, so yeah, it has, it, kind of, it has shifted slightly away from this just like uh, what, what we call in the academic sphere moral suasion, i.e. just lent here, but essentially it is still going on behind the scenes. Um, I, qu I question whether it's fully green, though, because I think there is still a lot of support going to um, various unsustainable industries. Um, Japan is actually a really interesting um, example because they uh, were one of the first central banks to implement a, a differentiated refinancing line. So they provide, I think it's like zero cost refinancing for banks to then lend on to, to green sectors. Um, so this is you know, a, a policy which lots of people in this room have advocated for, and there's some really detailed, great uh, uh, think tank work out there on um, trying to call for the Bank of England and the ECB to do this kind of thing. But what's interesting in the way that the Bank of Japan implemented this is that they leave the definition of what is green to banks to decide, right? Um, so uh, shortly after they implemented this, um, uh, this, this policy, we, we kind of had a round table with various central banks and the, the BOJ kind of presented their proposal like it was the next best thing and we asked them, we were like, okay, but how do you know that it's actually going to go to, um, to, to green purposes? And they, they said, oh, we're, well, we're happy for banks to um, kind of use whichever green framework they, they pick from all the various plethora of ESG initiatives there are out there and we'll, we'll just trust that essentially. So even though on the surface this looks like a credit policy, actually it's still leaving the private sector with, um, it, 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 I, would, I would argue it's a form of de-risking in that it's kind of nudging the price signals, but it's leaving the actual allocation of credit, that sectoral decision, essentially still to, 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 the, to the private banking sector. And indeed we've seen lots of cases of, of, of greenwashing from this programme. So a lot of stuff goes to you know, gas as a transition fuel, um, yeah, some other questionable activities. So yeah, that's kind of where um, that I think that J Japanese example also reveals the, the tensions of, of implementing credit policy within, within the current regime. Great. Thank you, Katie.